Section 1.2 is row reduction and echelon forms. So in section 1.1, we were discussing solving linear systems of equations and even converting those linear systems of equations into matrices, putting it into some sort of triangular form and using back substitution to solve the system. So this is going to formalize those techniques um, in terms of the matrix. So what we'll do is we'll convert our systems into the augmented matrices the coefficient of matrix, the coefficient matrix, as well as the right hand side of the linear system of equations. And we'll put it into this what's called row echelon form. And this will formalize that triangular form that we're looking for in order to use back substitution to solve our system. So if we're given an M by N matrix, so some uh, positive integer M by some positive integer N, they're not necessarily the same, they're not necessarily equal. Um, a matrix in row echelon form satisfies the following three prop uh, properties. So one, if there are any rows consisting entirely of zeros, they're grouped together at the bottom of the matrix. So any row of all zeros goes to the bottom of that matrix. <clears throat> the second condition is that the first non-zero element in any row is a one called a leading one. Now, the textbook that we use defines this slightly differently. This, uh, we, we might call this a pivot position and it might not necessarily be a one. So um, other textbooks might use the definition or the condition that I've given here. It'll turn out that as long as the first non-zero element is non-zero, which is kind of redundant, um, that will be in some sort of uh, uh, row echelon form or a correct row echelon form. It's nicer to put it in uh, to have the first non-zero element be a one because it helps to solve the system in the end. So I'll stick to that convention for my row echelon matrices, but keep in mind that our book will allow a non-zero uh, pivot position is what they'll call that. We'll see that when we work on this. So the leading one of any row below the first row is to the right of the leading one of the row above it. So if there's a leading one here in a matrix and we have another leading one, it's always going to follow a progression to the right. Any subsequent leading ones will be to the right of the other leading ones, making the rest of these lines here zeros. And that looks a little bit like, if we accept the horizontal lines as zeros and the dots as our pivot positions or our leading ones, the triangular form that we are looking for in the last section. So these three simple conditions formalize that triangular shape that we're looking for for these matrices. So uh, let's have a look at a couple of ma or matrices that are in row echelon form. They ask us to write down the system of linear equations corresponding to each and then find their solutions. So we'll do some of that, maybe not all of it. Now notice that this matrix is in row echelon form, right? Um, we have a leading one in the first row and the next leading one is to the right of that one. And the next leading one is to the right of that one, right? If we were to swap row two and row three, these two, then we'd be out of order, right? We wouldn't, our leading ones would not be moving to the right as we descend the rows of our matrix. Okay, there are no rows of zeros, so there's no row of zeros to put anywhere in this, so that all qualifications are met. Again, the book does not require the first element in a row to be a one, the first non-zero element to be a one. So this could be something like, an equivalent system of 2, 14 for that one and seven. And that would also be in row echelon form according to the book. But notice it's just not as easy to solve the system if you have a two and 14 there as it is to solve a one and a seven, because remember that in each of these columns, they correspond to the coefficients of x1, x2, and x3. The right-hand side or the augmented column is the right-hand side of the equations. So interpreting this row echelon matrix back into the system that it, it's involved in, we have x1 plus 2x2, reading the first row's coefficients into the coefficients of the terms. No value for x3, it's a zero, right? So I just leave a space there, equals three. Then I've got x2 plus 5x3 was negative two. And then the last line is that x3, nothing for x1 or x2, is equal to seven. 
So you see the utility of leaving leading ones now because we can solve for x3 at seven and then we can pass that value to the line above in back substitution to find x2 and then we can pass x2 and x3 in to find x1. So let's go ahead and do that. This system yields, well, the next one we'll solve will be what x2 is, right? We'll have x2 plus five times x3. Well, x3 is seven and that's equal to negative two. This second equation is now fully ready to solve for x2. And we see that, well, x2 plus 35 equals negative two tells us that x2 is actually negative 37 once we solve for it. Okay, and then taking x2 and x3, plugging them in and the first equation, we get x1 plus, well, there is no x3 in the first equation. So we have two times negative 37 is x2 equals three. And of course the other two values follow, x2 is negative 37 and x3 is seven. Um, two times negative 37 is negative 74. We add 74 to both sides and we see that x1 is actually equal to 77. So the solution, the three tuple solution to this is x1, x2, x3 is equal to 77, negative 37 comma seven. So here we are with our three tuple solution. Okay, and we see that it's nothing more than the back substitution technique we were using before, but this demonstrates that if we're in row echelon form, then it's pretty easy to use back substitution in the steps that are outlined below here uh, to come up with a solution to the system. So <clears throat> one thing to keep in mind is if this had been two 14 instead of one seven, just a multiple of two on the third row, it's the book's form of row echelon, and that's okay. Um, when we would have solved for x3, we would have arrived at two x3 equals 14 first, solve for that and you get x3 equals seven. So um, making all of your leading or your pivot positions into leading ones, to translate from the books, pivot positions to my leading one definition, um, just simplifies the process. So though it isn't necessary, we can see that we could get the solution otherwise still, and you'd have the same solution as well. So now this second matrix is also in row echelon form. Notice we do have a row of zeros for this one, and that row of zeros is passed down to the bottom. And let's interpret what this system of equations is here, right? So each of our leading ones steps down and to the right, Right, so each subsequent row has a leading one or a pivot position to the right of that before it. Everything else before it is zeros, right? In all of these cases. So we are in row echelon form. Now our system would be x1 minus 8x2 plus 2x3 equals 12. And then we have x2 plus 17x3 equals zero. And then lastly, we have x3 equals 13. And we don't really write the last column because, well, the bottom is just zero equals zero. I said the last column, it's actually the last row. We don't write the last row because that's just zero equals zero. That's absolutely true. It has no bearing on our system solution. And again, using back substitution, we can come up with x1, x2, x3, just like we did above. I'll leave that as an exercise um, for the reader because it's no different than what we've already done. And we'll have a unique solution to this um, because we have three equations and three unknowns. So everything is matched. And this is in our, we'll have a unique solution because we're in row echelon form. We're going to see results that confirm that later on. Okay, so the, the algorithm for getting into row echelon form, that's the real bit of work in this section. Right? Just taking something in row echelon form and converting or drawing the solution from it is not necessarily difficult, as we've already seen here. So the tactics you use is to establish a leading one in the leftmost column possible. So you want to make a leading one in your matrix as far to the left as you possibly can. Um, you establish that and then you make that your first row. 
Okay. If you're sticking with pivot positions, you're going to make a non-zero value in your um, in your leftmost position possible and make that the first row as well. I recommend making it a leading one. I think things are just cleaner that way. So we use the leading one to, to zero out all non-zero entries below it. Okay. So we'll see how that goes in the example below, but we'll use multiples of our leftmost leading one row to get rid of all the non-zero terms below that leading one's position. So we'll clear out that row, that leading one's column. And then we move down to the next row. We establish the leftmost leading one we possibly can or pivot position. Then we use that value to zero out everything below it. And we continue so on and so forth until we get down to the last row and uh, no longer have any rows to put leading ones into or we just have an entire row of zeros possibly. So let's put this given matrix into row echelon form. This looks like a pretty easy one. It's just a two by two. So two rows by two columns. So two by two. So remember that our row operations are any multiple of row one added to row two or vice versa, or any multiple of one row added to another row, um, multiplying a row by a number and uh, swapping or interchanging the positions of two rows. So the first thing we should do is we, we realize that we already have a one in the leftmost position possible in the first row. So let's leave that there. So that pushes us on to step two in this algorithm. Let's zero out everything below this one. So in order to do so, the next matrix we write, the equivalent matrix we'll have will be a matter of taking row two and replacing it or assigning it row two minus two times row one. And we see that this, I'll write out row one is one, two. Row one is unchanged. We're only using its information to modify row two. So I'll write out everything that happens here. This is the row two element minus two times the row one element in that column. Well, that's a one, this value here. And then we'll have negative five, the row two element, minus two times the row two element in that column, which is two. And that's effectively row two minus two times row one, swapping out for row two. So row one is unchanged. We're operating on row two. Two minus two in the first line is zero. So the zero here. And then negative five minus four gives us a negative nine right here. Okay. Now we've zeroed out all positions beneath this leading one. There was only one, so that's fine. We move down one row and we scan along this row and try to find the first non-zero value that we can. Well, that would be this negative nine right here. So the next step is to, well, we could say this is row echelon form per the book's definition because we have a non-zero value here and there are no more rows to consider and we're all done. But I think it looks a little nicer and it's a little better to work with this if we convert this negative nine to a one. It's such an easy task that we might as well. So we're gonna, div we're gonna divide the third row by negative nine, or in other words, multiply, I'm oh, sorry, the second row, multiply row two by negative one ninth. And what we'll be left with is one, two, zero, one. And we now have a leading one. They step right as we step down. So we're in row echelon form. There's no leading one below the below a row that is to the left of the leading one above it. So we have that triangular form we've always looked for. So this is row echelon form, and we can box our equivalent matrix or row equivalent matrix up. So that's it for a two by two. It's usually a couple steps to get a two by two into row echelon form. So let's do a two by three, two rows by three columns. We'll, consider, we'll continue with this. So this is somewhat similar to what we had before. Let's interchange rows two and rows three, right? Because we already have a one here in row two. Part of the reason I like a leading one versus just a pivot position value is that it's very easy to modify a one to cancel out another value in, a, in, the, in the same column. So that's one of the motivations to have pivot positions be leading ones instead of just non-zero values. So we're gonna swap rows one and two. Um, I'll use this notation for that, swap row one and two. And what we end up with is one, 
negative three, zero. It's just the same as rewriting the order of your systems of equations if we're dealing with a linear system. It doesn't change, doesn't change the system or the solution. It just kind of rearranges things in a more useful way. So now we have this, we have our leading one picked out. We have a leftmost leading one or non-zero value here. We're gonna use that to zero out everything below it. In this case, I want this term to go to zero. I don't care what happens in the rest of this row. So the next move is to take and replace or assign to row two, the value row two minus two row one. Right, so we recreate row two by modifying it with row one's values. Row one is unchanged. And let's see, two minus two is zero. One minus two times negative three, that's one minus negative six. So that's one plus six and we get a seven. I'll let you check that on your own if you need to pause the video. And then we have this position minus two times this value. So one minus two times zero, that's just one. Okay, so now we're at this point, the book would accept this as row echelon form since the seven is a non-zero value and it's staggered down and to the right as we move down to this row. Uh, however, we'll do just fine to multiply row three by one seventh, because, or sorry, row two, again, by row seven, or by one seventh. And that way we'll just have a leading one there. It makes the other term a fraction, but it's better to have a one here really for most calculations than it is to have something else. This fraction is more or less acceptable here. So this is row echelon form with leading ones. Um, the previous one would have been row echelon form with pivot positions. So this is perfectly acceptable. Now remember, if we were to treat this as an augmented matrix, this would be X1, X2's column, and this would be the right-hand side. And row echelon form gives us a triangular system in which we know that x2 is equal to 1 7th. So with the leading ones there, our variables are already solved for. Then x1 minus 3x2 equals 0. We could solve for x1 if we wanted to. The problem just doesn't ask for that. So I'll eliminate that. But that's the point of putting things into these row echelon forms. And this actually looks like the augmented matrix um, or an equivalent augmented matrix for a linear system of equation, uh, two equations and two variables, but we'll get to that soon enough. So reduced row echelon matrices are even more useful than row echelon matrices. So reduced row echelon matrices are row echelon matrices first with a further condition that any column containing a leading one has zeros everywhere else. That sounds a little bit like the previous definition and the book will add a further constraint that the leading, that the pivot positions all have to be ones. In my case, we've already defined the, the pivot positions as leading ones anyway, and we're already converting them to ones. But instead of just having zeros below a leading one, like here, we also need zeros above any leading ones, like here and here in these examples down below. So this is reduced row echelon form. Before, we didn't care about the zeros above leading ones. We just let them be non-zero if that was the case. Um, now we want to zero out everything above the leading ones because that's even better. If we look at a system that looks like this and considered it to be an augmented matrix with perhaps x1, x2, and a right-hand side, then we could say, oh, we immediately see that x1 equals zero. And from the second row, x2 equals two. And well, the third row is just zero equals zero. So that's not really useful for a solution. So that's the linear system of equations corresponding to each of these. We could do the same for the, the matrix down below. In this case, we have x1 plus 2x2 plus 0x3 equals zero. Remember, this is our right-hand side here. The other three columns are x1 and x2 and x3's coefficients. We have x3 equals zero, but down below is a curious situation. All zeros and a one, well, we've seen something like this in the last section. This tells us that zero equals one. This is inconsistent. So this system actually doesn't have a solution. It's inconsistent and it has a, a contradiction within it. So we have to conclude that there is no solution. Even though we started to find solutions to these values, it turns out that this thing is implying that zero is equal to one. That's impossible. 
Nonetheless, um, on top of all of this, these systems are in reduced row echelon form. You'll notice any leading one or any pivot position has zeros above and below, or below and also above it, which is beyond just row echelon form. So let's put a matrix into reduced row echelon form. The extra step that we use in this case is rather than just zeroing out all entries below a pivot, a leading one or a pivot position, we zero out all entries above it as well. So we take an extra step when we establish a leading one to get rid of the non-zero values above it as well as below it. So in this case, we're gonna start out with our matrix. Um, let's swap positions, right? I have a one down here. Let's go ahead and swap rows. So row one swaps with row two to give us the equivalent matrix one, negative three, two, one. Okay, um, here's my leading one. And I have this two here down in violation of uh, row echelon form, so I need to get rid of it. I need to zero it out by taking row two, assigning it the value of row two minus two row one. So I rewrite row two as itself minus two times row one. Row one is unchanged. We just use its information to change row two. So this is two minus two times this. So two minus two is zero. Of course, that one's always the easy one to see. And all the subsequent columns are a little bit trickier. We'll have one minus two times negative three. So one minus negative six is one plus six. We'll have seven again. Okay, we now have um, zeros below this leading one. There is no row above it. So there are no zeros to make above it. So our next move is to multiply row two by one seventh. So we have a pivot position of a leading one, so zero, one. And now the only violation left for reduced row echelon is this. We don't have anything below this leading one, so we only need to zero out above this leading one. So in order to do so, we'll do row one is going to be equal to itself plus three times row two. So that means, well, three times this is zero plus one, just leaves us with a one. Negative three, or you know, negative three plus three times one is negative three plus three. We get a zero as intended. We have a zero, one, and here we are. This is our reduced row echelon form. Uh, we're in row echelon form because of the staggering along rows moving to the right. And we have zeros both above and below each of our leading ones in this matrix. So reduced row echelon form. It is the easiest form to get a solution for our system for from an augmented matrix because everything is essentially solved for us. Now, the cost to it is the fact that we have to convert matrices to reduced row echelon form, which is a fairly computationally intensive problem. So when we convert a matrix to row echelon form and then use back substitution to solve that system, we're using Gaussian elimination, just as we did for linear systems in the previous section. So in this case, let's use Gaussian elimination. In other words, put this system into an equivalent row echelon form augmented matrix and then solve it. We'll express our solution parametrically, which is really just a list of what each of the variables is equal to, right? You might've seen parametric equations in a, a calculus three course, potentially in an algebra course, or possibly even in a physics course where you dealt with projectile trajectories or something like that. Nonetheless, we'll see it in this problem here. So first things first, let's write the augmented matrix of this system of equations. Uh, remember, we'll have x1, x2, x3, and a right-hand side. We're going to have four columns, one for each of the variables, and then one for the right-hand side. We don't need to write these labels up above. I'm just doing that for, for a visual cue for now. I'll probably drop that in subsequent examples. So we have one, three, one for the coefficients of x1, 2, and 3 and then negative four. Then we'll have zero, two, four. This is reading across the second row, the two at the end. And then we'll have one, one, zero, three. Okay, so we already have a one in the top left. So I'm happy to leave that in place. However, we have one violation below it. We need to zero out all the values below that leading one. So our first step is to take this matrix or this first row or this third row and add negative one times row one to it. 
So let me write down that step right now. So let's enclose our matrices in braces, brackets, and we have uh, row three is going to be the value row three minus row one. Pretty simple step, pretty easy to see. One, three, one, negative four. We don't have to do anything to row two, by the way, because that's already a zero. So at least for now, zero, two, four, two. And then row three minus row one. So one minus one is zero. One minus three is negative two. And then zero minus one is negative one. And then three minus negative four is three plus four, so that's seven. Okay, now one step that could happen here, we could move on and say, let's find our next pivot position. Well, our next pivot position is here. We could turn that into a leading one, but there's no reason to do that right away because we could just take row two, add it to row three. We wanna be careful not to add any more uh, non-zero values to this column. So we're done using row one to modify things. We need to go down and use either row two to modify row three or vice versa. But if we add row two to row three, we'll get a zero below what's going to be our new pivot position for row two. So that's exactly what we'll do. Um, it's just being a little bit more clever about things, but we could, we could force this to be a leading one by dividing that row by one or by two and moving from there. Um, so we have a little bit of flexibility in how we do these things. So row three is gonna be itself plus row two. Move that backwards, but nonetheless the same. So we have one, three, negative one, oh, uh, just one, negative four in row one. Row two is unchanged. We're just using it to modify row three. And we have zero, zero, right? Because zero plus zero is zero. And then we have two plus negative two or negative two plus two, looking at it from uh, row three's perspective to get a zero. And then we've got negative one plus four is a three. And then seven plus two is a nine. And this is our current state, our current equivalent system. Now this should be pretty straightforward, right? We can move from here to, we'll have, well, we wanna modify this to be a leading one and this to be a leading one. There's not much work to do beyond that. So we'll have one half times row two, and then we'll have one third times row three as our operations. And what we'll arrive at is one, three, negative, uh, one, negative four for row one, zero, one, two, one, row two, zero, zero, one, three for row three. And we've got um, row echelon form, right? It's not reduced row echelon form because above it, we have non-zero values above leading ones, namely those three space, those three values. However, below each of those leading ones, we have zeros and we stagger to the right as we move downward with our leading ones. And what we have is a triangular system that when we write it out, well, let's write it backwards. Well, we know that X3 is three. That's from our third row, the bottom line, X3 equals three. So remember this is X1, X2, X3, the coefficients of those variables. And here's our right-hand side. This tells me X3, one times X3, equals three. In other words, x3 equals three. Now, x2 plus two x3 equals one. This is row two. Right? I'm writing these things in reverse order as I go through my back substitution. Well, I know that this equation is x2 plus two, x3 is three as follows because, well, that's my uh, uh, substitution for x3. So I have x2 plus 6 equals 1. So x2 is equal to 1 minus 6. So x2 is negative 5. Okay. x1 now plus 3x2. I'm reading the, I'm taking the coefficients off the top line in our row echelon matrix. Plus x3 equals negative 4. Now we substitute into this all of the values that we know. We know x2 and x3. So x1 
plus three times x2 is negative five, plus x3 is three equals negative four. So now I have negative 15 plus three, x1, negative 15 plus three is negative 12. Add that to both sides, we have negative four plus 12 and we get x1 is eight. You can check the details of that on your own, of course. And this is our solution. Um, it's not quite written in parametric form. Parametric form is different from a tuple in that we just list each variable's value. It's actually the more, the more, um, the more familiar way of writing the solution down is actually what the parametric form will look like. So let me make, create some room for each of these and I'll get my answer fully expressed here at the end. So really, there's not much to the parametric form in this case because it is a unique solution. Each variable has one value to it. So we write this parametric form. Usually it's written vertically um, as, as rows, but I'm a little bit out of room. So I'll write x1 is equal to whatever x1 is, eight. Keep in mind that could be a function of the other variables in future problems. x2 came out to negative five and x3 came out to three. So parametric solution is this. That's versus a tuple where we just group all three of those as eight comma negative five comma three with parentheses around it. So this is our parametric solution, a parametrically expressed solution. So let's try this again. We'll use Gauss-Jordan elimination this time, which is actually where we take the augmented matrix of a system and we take it to reduced row echelon form, and then we solve it from there. We'll see that that's easier to write the solution down from, but it's more steps in terms of uh, matrix operations. I would suggest this is a little bit better method than Gauss elimination. I don't like coming back into the variables. I'd rather take the matrices all the way to the bitter end so that I can write down exactly what each variable is, right? So in other words, zero out the values above my leading ones, and then I'll know exactly what each variable is. If we were to do that in this case, we'd see we should we should see that we arrive at the same value as we came up with. But let's do it for this other problem. So reduced row echelon form is our goal. So first we write our augmented matrix down. It's the coefficients with the right-hand side column. So we have one, one, negative one, eight, two, three, one, negative three. I'm just reading the constants from left to right. I do make sure that my variables are in order, x, y, z, x, y, z, x, y. I'll have to watch that, make sure I put those things carefully, those coefficients carefully in place. Three x, so there's a three in the x position. Four y, so there's a four in the y position. There is no z, so I put a zero, and I have two in the right-hand side. Okay, everything is by place. So the zero place, or the z place has a zero in the third row. Um, Again, we got lucky. The first value up here happens to be a one. Let's choose that to be our leading one. And we'll work from there. We need to zero out everything below that leading one's position. And that's just for the requirement of row echelon, not even reduced row. So let's do two steps in one. In one. Let's take row two and take itself subtracted from two times row one. And we'll set row three to be itself minus three times row one. We're using this one in row one to, to bash out the two and the three in the positions below it. So that looks like this row two is itself minus two row one and row three is itself minus three row one. And that's just to get rid of this value and this value respectively. Okay, so that's a, maybe a lot of operations in one. I don't uh, I wouldn't encourage you to do this until you feel comfortable with these row operations, but with some practice um, doing multiple. Um, notice the one thing that we are doing, we're, we're, we're using row one to change these other two rows. I wouldn't want to change row two and then use row two to change row three down here all in the same step. That's really confusing. But if we're using row one to change two different rows, rows two and three, then it's pretty easy to do that. And that's the way I would recommend combining steps. So row one is unchanged, one, one, negative one, eight. Uh, so this is a zero, 
because it's row two, two times two minus two times one is two minus two is zero. Three minus two times one is three minus two is one. One minus negative two times negative is one plus two, so that's a three. And negative three minus two times eight is negative three minus 16, that's negative 19. Um, the third row, we have a zero by design, of course. Now four minus three times one is four minus three is one. And then we have zero minus negative three times negative one is zero plus three. And then we have two minus negative three times eight, two minus 24 is negative 22. Okay. And something looks a little fishy here. I think we're gonna to start to see these patterns. Um, if not, no worries, we'll catch it soon enough. We proceed with row echelon or reduced row echelon form until we run into something problematic. Well, now I get to here, I have a new leading one. This one's been zeroed out below, so we're all set. I need to zero out above it and below it. Since I'm operating with row two on two separate rows, then I can combine those steps pretty safely. So row, row one is going to be itself minus row two. We're getting rid of a one with a one. And similarly for row three, row three is itself minus, oops, row one, or row two rather, that middle row. So this is in the interest of getting to reduced row echelon, I need to zero out below it as well as above it. And that's Gauss-Jordan elimination versus row echelons elimination, which is just Gaussian elimination. So I'll have one, one minus one is zero, negative one minus three is negative four. Uh, eight minus negative 19 is eight plus negative nine, or eight plus 19, so that's 27. Zero, one, three, negative 19, row two is unchanged. And then I'll have at the bottom zero, and let's see, one minus one is zero. Three minus three is zero. Negative 22 minus negative 19 is gonna be negative three. So it's this. A next step, well, we have zeroed out above and below. So this leading one is happy. We move down a row and we scan across till we get our first non-zero, that's negative three. Well, the only step we need to do to take here is, or take here is to multiply or divide negative three along the third row, or multiply by negative one third, and we'll see the following. One, zero, negative four, 27. We'll have zero, one, three, negative 19, zero, 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 one. Now, if anything doesn't seem fishy yet, then we should try to rewrite this equation the system of equations from this matrix. Um, I, the, the last step we could do, sorry, we're not quite in reduced row echelon form, is eliminate or zero out these entries. Well, notice that the way the algorithm works, we don't work above or below a leading one until we're done with the previous leading one zeros, because we don't want to introduce non-zero values to places where we've already gotten rid of non-zero values. So we always work from left to right, top to bottom, or top to bottom, left to right. Um, in this case, it's really easy to see that these three zeros in this row won't affect any of these values. So it doesn't matter what we multiply um, row three by and add to rows two and rows one. Um, we know that we can multiply row three by 19 and add it to row two and zero that 19, negative 19 out and do something similar for 27. It's almost like when we have a row of all zeros with just one one, we can just bash out everything above it and make it zero because it's really easy to do that. So in this case, our equivalent matrix, I won't even write the steps down, is one, zero, negative four, zero, zero, one, three, zero, 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 one. You can take that shortcut because, well, you know you can multiply this row by anything and add it to the other rows. And the only thing it's going to change are the values directly above the one. So that's an easy calculation to do right there. Okay, if we still haven't caught it, well, first off, let's point out that this is indeed in reduced row echelon form. Each leading one has zeros below and above it. 
So we are in reduced row echelon form, that checks out. We're in row echelon form as well. We stagger from left to right as we move downward on our leading ones. And to convert the system back, we'd say we look at the, the last row and this is where we get into trouble. Remember this is X, the coefficients of X1, X2 and X3. And this is the right hand side. So what this system is, this augmented matrix is telling me is that for our bottom row, the one we always write down first, 0x1 plus 0x2 plus 0x3, which is all zeros on the left-hand side, equals one. Well, that's inconsistent. The solution, this system does not have any solutions. It's an inconsistent system, thanks to that. So anytime we have all zeros here with a non-zero right-hand side, notice that this had been zero instead of one, we'd be okay and we could proceed with solving this, but in this case, we're inconsistent. So no solution to this one. And it's really easy to tell. It was in fact, pretty easy to see here. And it wasn't too difficult to see here either, knowing what steps were, were to come after that. But with practice, you should be able to spot these things um, uh, as you work on them. So one more example is the following. We'll have two X1. So express the solution parametrically. Well, the previous problem didn't have a solution, so there's nothing to express uh, parametrically. It's an inconsistent system. We could say no solution. So for the last example we'll do in the video here, uh, we'll write our augmented matrix 2, 1, negative 3, negative 4. We'll have 1, negative 1, 1, 3. We'll have 3, negative 2, Oops, I'm not being careful about it. Uh, x three x one plus zero x two minus two x three equals negative one. Remember our positions. Make sure everything was in order. X one, x two, x three for each of our rows and our right hand side reflects the right hand side given. Okay, so now we have translated our matrix. It's nice to use the labels above as a little template to help get it right. Make sure we don't write things down incorrectly. I believe we're off and running now. Um, I'm favoring this as a leading one. So let's swap rows one and two. So we'll get an equivalent system that looks like this just by swapping row one and two. We'll have one, negative one, one, three. Then we'll have two, one, negative three, negative four. And repeat the last, the third row. Okay, in order to get to row echelon form, I need to zero out these two places. So it'll be row two minus two times row one and row three minus two, three times row one. So taking those steps, I won't write them down, I've set it, so we'll leave it as it is. Um, it's probably helpful in your own work, so maybe I do write it down, row two is row two minus two row one. That way, if anybody's grading this or checking this, it'll be easy to see what you did. And if you're checking your own work, it'll be easy to see what you did as well. So let's see, we zero out the two by two, two minus two times one. We have one minus two times negative one. So we have one plus two is a three. Then we have negative three minus two times one. So that's negative three minus two is negative five. We have negative, um, we have negative four, minus six, we get negative 10. Similarly, for row three, we'll have zero here by design, three minus three times one, and then zero minus three times negative one. So that's zero plus three. Um, now we have negative two minus three times one is negative two minus three is negative five. And we'll also have negative one minus three times three is negative one minus nine is negative 10. Okay, and we see another similar pattern that we should pick up on and realize that, well, um, how about we just take row three and just zero it out, right? If row two is identical to row three, we can just subtract row three, uh, from, we can subtract from row three, row two. It's like the following. and we'll just zero out the third row. So anytime two rows match exactly, 
you just zero one out with the other one and try to put the row of zeros down at the bottom. You can always interchange if need be. In order to get to reduced row echelon form, we should take one third times row two. That's a helpful step and to clean things up a bit. One, negative one, one, three. Now we'll have a leading one here. One, negative five thirds, negative 10 thirds, and we'll have a row of zeros. Notice I don't stop and say this is inconsistent because the right-hand side is zero. The last row is telling me that zero equals zero. That's okay, that's not inconsistent. I don't have any problem with that. So we're not inconsistent, we continue to work on this. We need to zero out above and below this leading one in this row to get to reduced row echelon form. This is easy, we'll just at assign row one the value of itself plus row two. Then negative one, positive one will add to zero. We don't change the leading one, we have zero here. And then one minus five thirds, that's three thirds minus five thirds, it's negative two thirds. Nine thirds, three minus 10 thirds. Nine thirds minus 10 thirds is negative one third. Then we have zero, one, negative five thirds, negative 10 thirds, and then a row of zeros. Okay, we are actually in reduced row echelon form now. We're in row echelon, we stagger to the right, the leading ones. Any, uh, any row of zeros is at the bottom. And we're in reduced row echelon form because above and below our leading ones, we have zeros. So we're all set to pull our solution from this equivalent matrix system. So we'll have X1, and it looks like minus two thirds, remember that's the X3 position equals negative one third. We'll have to do some simplification in a moment here. Then we'll have X2 minus five thirds, X3 equals negative 10 thirds. Okay, and that's all we get. The last equation is zero equals zero. We have two equations in three unknowns still. The common variable is X3. So one way to know that it would be X3 is it's down here and it doesn't have a leading one. X1's row, column and X2's column have leading ones. X3's column does not have a leading one anywhere in its column. So we know that X3 is going to be free. That's one way that you can tell. The other way is that X3 occurs in all the equations. So let's make X3 the free variable. That's the natural choice. We might have more than one free variable in the future. So what we'll say down here is X3 is free, it's a free variable. So to write our solution parametrically, we want to express all the variables in terms of X3. So X1 is equal to negative one third plus two thirds X3, solving for X1. X2, solving for it, we have negative 10 thirds plus five thirds X3. And X3 has no constraint on it. It's free, right? It didn't have, this equation didn't tell us X3 had to be anything. It just told us the, the tautologically true, the patently true zero equals zero. So this is our parametric solution to this system. Okay, so I'll leave the last example as an exercise. Notice that you'll have five columns. You'll have one, 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 zero, zero for X1 through X4 and the right-hand side but your row echelon or reduced row echelon form will be the same. Um, notice we only have three equations. So we'll either have a row of zeros down at the bottom um, or we'll have a, a free variable or two free variables. So there are examples similar to it in the book, but this is a nice exercise to work on your own. Put this into row echelon or reduced row echelon form and uh, express the solution parametrically if the solution exists.